I usually don't beg on this YouTube channel, but today, I'm gonna beg. Could you please like this video before the video even starts? I'm about 60 hours into this video. This is my fourth time redoing. Why? Because every time that I recorded this banger of a video, I kept running into audio issues. And by the third time, the audio didn't come out so bad. But since I give a I couldn't let you guys listen to this. So right in the beginning of the movie, we see a shot of a skyscraper that's looking up, up. So right in the beginning of the movie, we see a shot of a skyscraper that's looking up above. So please, I put in work. If you can find a tiny little speck of dust, like whatever little tinsy biggie ounce of sympathy you still have left in your body. I know it's been a rough year. Could you just use that and just hover your finger or your mouse over the like button right now and just press the like button because please, I would, I would really appreciate it. So I left a community post asking you guys what videos or what topics you would like for me to talk about going into next week. Nothing is off of the tables. And a lot of you guys asked me to do reviews of really good bad movies. And let me be the first to say that. Here's a joy. Came down my eyes. Okay, because I've been trying to review really good bad movies for years now. I just didn't think that that's something that you guys would want to see. But now that I know it is something that, that you want to see. <laughs> oh man, thank God. I'm finally going to start having fun on this channel instead of always being in pain. So since it's been such a long time since I even watched a really good bad movie, I didn't know where to begin. But thank God that you guys also came with suggestions because some of you guys suggested that I should check out this director called Neil Breen. So I went on his IMDb page and I just got astonished because this guy has such a huge library of work that I can't believe I let this guy fly under the radar for so long in my life. Was I living under a rock or what? No. No, I wasn't living under a rock. It's just that not enough people talk about him and that needs to change. He needs to be a household name. You see, what's fascinating about Neil Breen is that not only does he write, produces, directs, edits, but he also stars in his own movies, which means that he has the whole creative control of the whole process from beginning to end, which once you watch one of his movies, you understand why he needs to have so much control over everything because he is just a genius. The first movie that I watched from him was called Faithfully Findings because that's the movie that faithfully found me. And you might not believe me when I say this, but my quality of life has improved dramatically ever since I watched that movie. So if you would like to know my opinion about Neil Breen's movie called Fateful Findings, what I thought about it, well then you're in luck today because that's what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to give you my full honest review of this movie, okay? It is life changing. So without further ado, I'm excited because this is the fourth time that I'm recording this video. Let's get right into it. The movie starts with this shot of a skyscraper that we get to see from the bottom all the way to the top and it stays there for a very prolonged amount of time which don't get too attached to the skyscraper because we never get to see it again. It then immediately cuts into a storage facility, but there is a hallway in the storage facility, and at the end of that hallway lays the thickest book I've ever seen in my life. A person of my reading capabilities, it would take them probably like 10 years to finish reading that book, but a person of your reading capabilities, probably 20. And then after that, it immediately cuts into a scene with these two children that are prancing in the woods without any adult supervision whatsoever. And what happens when two children are out there unattended by any adult supervision in the woods without anybody telling them what's right and wrong? Well, they find the world's biggest mushroom, that they get mesmerized by it. But then immediately the mushroom transforms into a treasure chest, and these two children, well, they're not even phased by it. To them, this is just everyday life, which I guess kind of proves that they've done shrooms before. Anyway, so kids will be kids and they open up the treasure chest to find a bunch of little pieces inside of it. But don't worry, these kids are well versed in knowledge of treasure chests. Apparently, if you take something out of a treasure chest, you have to replace it. If not, it's bad luck. Look what I found. A treasure. It's a magical day. It must mean something. It's buried treasure. You can't leave the box empty. It's bad luck. I'm not afraid. Now you might be asking yourself, did Neil Breen purposely cast the world's two worst child actors on purpose? Or was the acting just really that bad? And I'm gonna have to let you know that I think that this is the genius of Neil Breen. 
Because the acting in this whole movie is going to stay the same. These kids are not any better or any worse than anybody else that's going to be in this movie going forward. So there's, they're like cleansing your palate for the experience that you're about to have going into this movie. Some people might find that very annoying. I personally find that very amazing. Anyway, so as a shutter along, you come to find out that these two, well, they're not really brother and sister. No, they're not related. They're actually neighbors. And they happen to be the best of friends. And they had an epic summer. But unfortunately, the girl has to move because her dad got transferred to another position in another city. So just like in real life, sometimes people have to move. And, and they do an epic goodbye to each other. They're all like, goodbye, my friend. I'll never see you again. And all this scene can make me think about is how my mom would have a panic attack if my body laid out the window like that. Anyways, maybe 20, 30 years go by. It is the future now. And we get to see Neil Breen. He's the little boy that was little, and now he's all grown up. And I'm assuming he's leaving his job, but not so fast. Because he gets yeeted by Rolls Royce. Like, I'm talking about he eats it. And as you watch that scene, the only thing that I could think about is... I wish a Rolls Royce would hit me that hard. Trust me, if you're ever walking down the street and a Rolls Royce hits you, that's just God looking out for you. So as Neil is laying there, dying, people gather around him. And they're all like, oh my God, oh no. Oh, do you guys think he's alive? Check if he's breathing. But the acting, the acting. Call 911. Call 911. Is he dead? Is he dead? It's the Rolls Royce that hit him. I saw it. I'm a witness. Is he breathing? You know what I think is going on with the acting? I feel like Neil Breen purposely casted the world's worst actors on purpose so that his own acting can be the best acting in the movie. You know, being a little diamond in the rough. I'm on to you, you cheeky cheeky Neil. Anyway, so as the movie goes along, Neil gets transported to the hospital where we come to find out that <sighs> he ain't doing too well. He's in a straight up coma because he suffered severe head injury and he has a very little chance of making it. He's in critical condition, unconscious, and it does not look good. We were on the phone when he was hit. <laughs> no, he can't hear you. He suffered extreme head trauma. Nah, psych. Neil ain't no b Because a little bit after that moment, he just, you know, wakes up, takes off his bandages, gets dressed, and then, get this, he teleports back home. Yes, he teleports and I don't blame him. If I could teleport, I would teleport home too before they gave me that bill. You know what they say about the hospital. It's the world's most expensive one star hotel. Anyways, once Neil is home, he goes back to his job of being a New York Times bestseller author. And we also get introduced to the second family in the movie. And this family is very important. In this family, the husband develops alcoholism because the wife doesn't want to have sex with him because apparently working at the bank is really backbreaking. You don't have sex anymore. Do you realize that? Where did that come from? It has been months. <laughs> What's happened? I'm very busy. My back is killing me. My office at the bank is having major problems. These are very, very important context clues. Remember them. We also come to find out that Neil was prescribed pain medication. Where are my pills? Where are my pills? But also, Neil knows the dangers of getting addicted to pain pills. So he flushes them down the toilet. But he doesn't really flush them, he just pours them in a toilet without flushing. And then his girlfriend, we come to find out that the curling girl that he's dating, well, she just has a straight up pain pill addiction. So as he leaves the bathroom, she proceeds to put her arm into the toilet bowl and take all of his pills out of the toilet bowl. Mm-hmm. And then she asks him this question. You're still not well. Did you take your meds? Jeez, that was a little bit weird because how could he have took his pills when you're the one that has them? And then Neil goes to a therapist, but I'm assuming at this point they ran out of budget for this movie because instead of actually getting like a real therapist office, his therapist evaluates him inside of a boardroom. 
Like this is a straight up boardroom. So the therapist, we come to find out that he's actually all about Team Neil. He wants him to take the medication, but also medication that's not going to make him not creative because he knows that he's an author and he needs his little creative juices flowing. Well, Neil just blows him off, shuts him down, and then dips like this, okay? He just, he just leaves. I offered you medication that would help you. I'm feeling less stable. That's like me going into my therapist's office, letting her know that I'm having those self-destructive thoughts again, and then bye. I feel like my therapist would at least try to stop me. I hope. So then once Neil goes home, he gets on the phone with the book publishing company, letting them know that he's working on his book. Please give him some time. But I also want you to notice that he also has the world's biggest coffee mug hanging right on his laptop. So I'm not sure if they're foreshadowing that he's about to spill a bunch of coffee on his laptop and he's not going to be able to release his book anymore. Let's see if I'm right. Ugh. Oh my god, I'm, I'm having a stroke. If only, if only I could sip some of my, oh no, I spilled the coffee all over my table and my face and on my computer and it's burning. Oh, what was that? That's the same reaction that I have when I hit my funny bone, but there's really nothing funny. So after that whole debacle, both of the families join together for dinner and everybody is all like, oh my God, Neil, look at you. You were in really rough shape at the hospital, but now you look like you're really good. Like you recovered so fast. How'd you do it? And Neil responds with the most gangster response I've ever heard in my life. It seems like it never happened. I've got great family genes, but I'm still in pain. From now on, if anybody asks me, how is my life going? I'm just gonna have to reply with, oh, you know, I got great family genes, but I'm still in pain. Oh, you well, how do you feel about the people that haven't liked the video yet, but they made it this far? Oh, you know, I got great family genes, but I'm still in pain. Anyways, that dinner ends horribly because the husband gets a little bit too drunk and he says some things that he should not have said. And then we come to find out that Neil, well, he doesn't want to write a book anymore. No, instead, he wants to hack the government so that he can expose this national and get this international corruption that he is so sure is going on. I've got so much to do, I'll never get done. I'm going to continue hacking into these government systems to see what I can find out about all this national and international corruption I know is going on. Yep, you get him, Neil. I agree with you. There's way bigger problems than somebody just having to write a second best-selling book. You expose that national and international corruption. But then that doesn't really wind up happening because his girlfriend that's addicted to pain pills just walks into the room and says that she's done and starts throwing his books on the floor. So then he grabs her by the arm like the romantic that he is and proceeds to push off not one laptop off of his table, destroying it, but both of his laptop off of the table, destroying that one too, which I can only assume that's what he was using to hack into the government's mainframe to show us the national and international corruption. And then he proceeds seats to make a whole mess out of his office just so that him and his girlfriend can have a little bit of a fun time together. I guess there goes the exposing of the national and international corruption that you knew was happening. And then it cuts into the next day where he's back in his office and everything that got destroyed is right back to where it was. Weird. It's almost as if that scene made no sense. But this time when his girlfriend walks in a room and has a whole little hissy fit, she says that it's actually getting very late and he should come to bed. But he ignores her offer and says, nah, I'm gonna keep working. And what's funny about that scene is that we can see the sunlight coming out of the window. It's late. Come to bed. 
We need your sleep. I'd love to, but I can't. I have too much to do. So because he ignored her offer, she then proceeds to think of the worst thing possible. So she hits him with this question. Are you having an affair? That's it, isn't it? You are, aren't you? No, I'm not having an affair. Don't be ridiculous. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, no. You see, Neil is not having an affair, but the story is about to get a little bit twisted. Because then they throw a barbecue, and the doctor that was supposed to take care of Neil for his head trauma, while well, she shows up to the barbecue and drops a notepad out of her pocket, the same notepad that the girl in the beginning of the movie wrote as the most amazing day. Is this the girl from the beginning of the movie, but all grown up? Well, yes. Yes, it is. So no, Neil's not having an affair, but I don't know about you, but I can smell the love in the air tonight. Is this yours? <laughs> yes, it's just something I've been carrying for good luck. Oh my God, is that you? It is, isn't it? It's you. No worries, Neil isn't a bad guy. Nothing happens during that scene. But then the husband, well, he gets drunk again. The whole barbecue gets cut short. And then that family goes home and they have a whole fight, okay? And every time they have a fight, he goes into his garage to clean his Ferrari. And by the looks of how spotless his Ferrari is, they must get into fights all the time. So his wife, well, she snaps. She goes into their bedroom and she loads up a gun because she's going to show that Ferrari that she's worth more than that Ferrari, even though he spends all of his time with that Ferrari. But the problem is, though, like she misses the Ferrari completely and accidentally shoots her husband. And Neil happened to be in the neighborhood. He overheard the gunshot. He got in their house. And as he was in the house, he just sees the wife all being frantic and stuff. And she says, oh, my God, I can't believe my husband committed suicide like Jeffrey Epstein. So now because of the husband's death, this took a major turn in the story. Everybody is super sad, especially Neil's current girlfriend. She is so sad that she cannot take the pain. It's too much. And she starts taking even more pills. And this angers Neil because he knows that underneath all of that, there is a good person that's not addicted to no pills so he gets upset and he goes into the park and you won't guess who he runs into at the park well none other than the original girl from the beginning of the movie the doctor <laughs> and they immediately reconnect and not only that they also confess their love for each other that they had since they were eight years old i couldn't tell my left and my right when i was eight years old and these two already knew that they were in love and had they ended the movie right there that would have been an epic mwah finish but of course it didn't end the movie right there. No, the movie's about to get real twisted. You see, our boy is in a huge dilemma now because what is he going to do about his other girlfriend back at the house? You know, Melania Trump? She got so used to him by now. What is he going to do about her? It's not fair for her. Well, luckily, Neil Breen is an amazing writer. He just writes her off by saying that she overdosed on pills. And it kind of makes sense because you guys remember she was addicted to them. So at the same time, it almost felt like it was a huge relief off of Neil's shoulders because now he can just be with his current girlfriend that, that he got since the beginning of the movie that he was always in love with while well, he's back with her. What a true love story, right? And you, you can't have any secrets from your true love, right? So he immediately tells his girlfriend about the government corruption that he's about to expose. All this time, I haven't been working on my next book. I've hacked into the most secret government and corporate secrets. The most secret. And discovered corporate and government cheating, lying, corruption, and hypocrisy. And he should have never done that because by letting her know about it, well, he put her life in danger. And in danger, it got, because later she gets kidnapped by people wearing all black. But no worries, just like all other cliche movies that left a clue of where they could be. And since Neil is such a smart man, well, he followed the only little piece of evidence that he could, and he found exactly where they were, inside of a storage facility, and he was sleeping on the job, guarding the door of where they kept a girl in. You know, this angered Neil so much that they got into an epic fighting scene. Where is she? Who? Oh. Leah! Leah! I don't know who that is. Give me the keys of these locks. I don't have any keys. Give me the key to the lock. I don't have a key. I don't know anything. Give me the key. I don't have... Leah. 
Leah. Jackie Chan ain't got nothing on my boy Neil. Okay, so as my boy Neil walks into the storage facility where his girlfriend is hidden, he unties her, and then he immediately reties her up and says, you can't see how we're gonna get out of here, just trust me. Because he uses his teleportation abilities to teleport themselves out of danger, and I'm assuming he's a little bit embarrassed and he doesn't want his girlfriend to know that he has the power to teleport, but if I had the ability to teleport, I'd be telling all the girls. Because I feel like that would only increase my chances of getting laid. And then as they're back at the house, for no apparent reason at all, Neil drives all the way into the desert, like hours away from his house, just to talk with the book from the beginning of the movie, that really thick book. Only thing though is that books can't talk, but Neil asked the book if he should be afraid. Should I be afraid? Should we be afraid? And why should he be afraid? Because the very next day, Neil goes in front of Capitol Hill and shows us all of the proof of the national and international corruption. And the evidence was so overwhelming that every person that he exposed, well, they committed suicide one by one just like Jeffrey Epstein. Our crimes are about to be disclosed. What an epic finale. Without these people being alive, well, the world can just thrive now. Neil Breen is the best. And I don't know about you, but maybe, maybe you thought that this movie was very badly written, very badly edited, very badly acted out, but I think that the whole point of a movie is to keep the audience captivated from beginning to end, and this movie succeeded at doing that. It captivated me from beginning to end. So I would personally like to give this movie a 10 out of 10. It is genius, and it lives on its lane of its own. And if you haven't seen this movie for your own, I'm gonna leave a link in the description down below to where you can get it on Amazon. You have to watch this movie if, I promise, your, your life will change for the better. And I swear to God, if you made it all the way into the end of this video and you haven't liked it yet, then I'm gonna have to let you know that I got really good family genes, but I'm still in pain.